Scientific curiosity about the inner workings of the human body has led to countless medical breakthroughs. Medical discovery has been a noble path, but one that has also experienced detours, such as this one, into crime and murder. In the early 1800s, Great Britain saw an increase in the number of students wanting anatomical training, and classrooms of medical colleges swelled to capacity. Most classes could easily be taught in lecture halls to many students, but anatomy classes had the special requirement of a corpse for lecture and demonstration purposes. Until the 19th century, Britain's laws specified that the only cadavers that could be used in these classes were those of recently executed criminals, as religious thought and superstitions of the time deemed it unthinkable to disturb a person's remains. The number of executions was, as William Ruffheed wrote, wholly inadequate to meet the growing needs, and the surgeons and barbers' apprentices had been in use diligently to till the soil and reap the harvest of what had been finally called death's mailing. This practice soon became the regular occupation of some underworld characters, and author Hugh Douglas wrote of the proficiency of these workers. Grave robbers could open a grave, remove a body, and restore the soil between patrols of the night watch. Relatives of the subject could mourn by the grave the following day, unaware that their loved one was gracing some anatomy slab in Edinburgh. Upon receiving a delivery of a cadaver from someone other than those authorized to transport criminals' corpses, doctors and their assistants most likely suspected that the bodies were from graves, but generally said nothing in order to keep the anatomy classes full of interested and paying students. Irishmen William Burke and William Hare, however, developed a more direct method to provide fresh cadavers to Edinburgh Anatomy schools. In one of his later confessions, William Burke gave a brief biography of himself. Burke is 36 years of age, was born in the parish of Ory, near Tyrone in Ireland. Served seven years in the army, most of that time as an officer's servant in the Donegal militia. He was married at Ballina, in the county of Mayo, when in the army, but left his wife and two children in Ireland. She would not come to Scotland with him. He's often written to her, but got no answer. He came to Scotland to work at the Union Canal and wrought there while it lasted. He resided for about two years in Peebles and worked as a laborer. He wrought as a weaver for 18 months and as a baker for five months. He learned to mend shoes as a cobbler with the man he lodged with in Leith. While lodging at Maddiston during his work on the canal, Burke met Helen MacDougall, a native Scot who was then, after separating from her legal husband, living with a man with whom she had two children. Burke and MacDougall left Maddiston together after the canal work was done, apparently leaving the two children behind, and the couple journeyed to Peebles and Leith and then to Edinburgh, scraping out a living by working on farms, selling old clothes, and mending shoes. William Hare had also journeyed from Ireland to Scotland to work on the Union Canal, although it's not known if he ever encountered Burke there. After the completion of the canal, Hare went to Edinburgh and found cheap lodgings in the area known as Westport at a boarding house of a man named Logue and his wife Margaret, who was also an Irish native. When Logue died in 1826, Hare provided enough comfort to the widowed Margaret that they were soon living as common-law husband and wife and running the lodging house as a married couple. Hare never provided a biography as Burke had, but Hare was described in an 1829 issue of Blackwood's magazine as the most brutal man ever subjected to my sight, and at first looked seemingly an idiot. His face when he laughed, which he often did, collapsed into a hollow, shooting up ghastily from chin to cheekbone, and steeped in sullenness and squalor, native to the almost deformed face of the leering miscreant. So utterly loathsome was the whole look of the reptile. When Burke and MacDougall moved to Edinburgh, they took up residence in Westport and by chance encountered Margaret Hare one day, who invited them back to the boarding house and introduced them to her husband. Soon after, Burke and MacDougall became paying lodgers of the Hares. The four of them would quarrel often and could never be described as friends, but they became permanently linked by a shared fondness for whiskey and the desire to make more money no matter the method. In November of 1827, one of Hare's lodgers, an old army pensioner named Donald, fell ill and died. Hare was not concerned about the man's actual death, but was outraged that Donald had passed away owing four pounds in rent. 
After the authorities had been called to fetch the man's body, Hare came up with a plan to get the money Donald owed him. With Burke's assistance, they took Donald's body out of the coffin and replaced it with an equal weight of tree bark and hid the corpse until the coffin had been taken away. The two then went off to find the offices of anatomy instructor Professor Monroe, but, in asking directions, were redirected to the classrooms of Professor Robert Knox. Knox's assistants said that they were interested in the body and to bring it after nightfall. That night, Knox's doorman answered the bell to find Burke and Hare and a large sack. Three of Knox's assistants examined the body and offered to pay a little over seven pounds for it. The two men quickly agreed and left the doctor's rooms discussing the obvious advantages of this method of making significant amounts of money with so little effort. Another of Hare's lodgers, Joseph the Miller, fell ill not many days later. Joseph owed no money to Hare and was not as seriously ill as Donald had been. But Hare and Burke discussed the situation and decided, with no medical expertise whatsoever, that Joseph was going to die and was in pain, and they decided to put him out of his misery. The two, showing great sympathy for Joseph's discomfort, gave the sick man glasses of whiskey until Joseph fell unconscious. Then one of the men held Joseph's nose and mouth shut while the other spread himself across the victim's prone body, pinning the arms and preventing any struggle. Joseph never regained consciousness and was soon on Knox's doorstep. Inadvertently, Burke and Hare had stumbled onto a foolproof method of murder with Joseph. It appeared that the victim had died from illness or drunkenness and there were no incriminating marks. They would repeat the process frequently over the next 11 months. Hare's other lodgers continued to be healthy, and so Burke and Hare eventually felt the need to seek out new merchandise for Dr. Knox outside of the lodging house. In February of 1828, elderly Abigail Simpson traveled to Edinburgh to collect her pension money. She started back home with a few shillings in her pocket when she met up with William Hare, who invited her to his lodging house to have a dram and rest up before her long journey home. She agreed, and soon Burke and Helen joined her and the Hares, and they all drunk until the evening. Being cold and dark, Abigail was easily persuaded to stay the night and then continue home the following morning. Burke and Hare had other ideas for her, but they were also so inebriated that they both fell asleep. The following morning, Abigail awoke with a bad hangover and accepted Burke and Hare's remedy of a little more whiskey. The first whiskey was followed by another, and soon Abigail was once again asleep on the bed. She didn't put up a fight as Burke and Hare smothered her, and her body was packed into a tea chest and taken that evening to Knox's rooms. For the first time, Dr. Knox personally inspected the body, and he remarked on the freshness of the cadaver, but did not inquire further. He authorized a payment of ten pounds. This flow of easy money coming into Burke and Hare's pockets did not cause them to save any of their bounties. The foursome primarily used the money on liquor, and it passed from their hands almost as quickly as it had been earned, and soon after one sale to Dr. Knox had been completed, they needed to begin looking for their next victim. Not long after Abigail's demise, another of Hare's lodgers, an Englishman who sold matches, fell ill. As they had with Joseph, Burke and Hare charitably put the poor man out of his suffering. Although Hare and Burke would later swear that neither Margaret nor Helen knew anything about the murders, the next merchandise brings this assertion into question. One day, Margaret Hare encountered an old woman out in the streets of Edinburgh and brought her back to her house where she began giving the woman whiskey. Margaret told the woman she should lie down, but the old woman declined and kept drinking. After three attempts, Margaret finally got the woman to rest in bed and quickly sent for her husband and Burke, who later appeared at Dr. Knox's doorstep that evening with a fresh delivery. On the morning of April 9th, 1828, 18-year-old Westport prostitutes Mary Patterson and Janet Brown began their day by heading to a local tavern. While drinking their first whiskies of the day, they encountered William Burke, who invited them back to his house for breakfast. Mary readily agreed, but Janet took more convincing. Yet soon, all three went off to Burke's brother's home, where the drinking continued and they had breakfast. Mary fell asleep at the table, and so Burke asked Janet to accompany him to another tavern where Janet drank more but did not become inebriated. Burke took her back to his brother's house and offered her more drink, but was surprised by the sudden appearance of Helen, who screamed at Burke and Janet. A fight ensued as Burke shouted back and eventually threw Helen out. 
Mary apparently continued to sleep through the violence. Janet, upset by the incident, prepared to leave, although Burke tried several times to convince her to stay. Janet refused but said she would return after Helen, who was still screaming and cursing from outside the door, had left. Instead of going home, Janet stopped by the lodging house of a Mrs. Lowry, with whom she and Mary had once lodged. Janet told Lowry of the day's events, and the landlady became concerned for Mary's safety and told Janet and one of her servants to return to Hare's and fetch Mary back immediately. On returning to Burke's brother's home, Janet found only the Hares and Helen in the house. She was told that Mary had gone out with Burke, but would return soon. Janet sent the servant back to Mrs. Lowry's and sat down to wait. The servant told Mrs. Lowry what had happened, and the landlady again became alarmed and told the servant to go back and bring Janet back with her. Janet dutifully returned to Mrs. Lowry's, avoiding for the third time that day the fate that had already befallen Mary. Mary Patterson's murder was the riskiest Burke and Hare had yet committed. When they brought the body to Dr. Knox's, several of his students recognized her, probably from having hired her services previously. Burke and Hare chose not to elaborate on how they came into possession of the body, and Knox's doorman stated that her body was so good a specimen that many of the students took sketches of it, one of which is in my possession. Janet would continue to walk the dark streets of Edinburgh inquiring about her friend Mary's whereabouts at every opportunity. The money collected for Mary Patterson soon ran out, and Burke and Hare went on watch for new sources of income. Opportunities quickly presented themselves. In his legitimate work as a cobbler, Burke occasionally bought leather from a beggar woman named Effie. One morning she attempted to sell some scraps to Burke, who invited her in and took her out to the lodging house's stable. After several drinks, Effie fell asleep in the straw. Burke went to fetch hair, and that evening they were ten pounds richer. Having brought several bodies to Dr. Knox without casting overt suspicion on himself, other than the recognition of Mary Patterson's body, Burke became even bolder and began taking more risks. In the streets one morning, he encountered two policemen carrying an obviously drunken woman to jail so that she could sleep off the previous night's entertainment. Burke told the officers that he knew the woman, even knew where she lived, and would take her home and see that she was properly taken care of. She was, and Burke and Hare divided another ten pounds that night. In June of 1828, Burke found an old man wandering the streets and lured him with promises of whiskey to come home with them. They were later stopped by an old woman and a young boy who asked for directions to the home of a friend of theirs. Burke said he knew exactly where they needed to go and abandoned the old man, who cursed him over the loss of the promised whiskey, and said he would take them to their friends. But why not stop and rest first at his house? The woman agreed and explained that the boy was her deaf grandson and they were not familiar with Edinburgh. The woman was soon inebriated from the refreshments that were offered, and while her grandson was with Margaret and Helen in another room, Burke and Hare murdered the woman by their usual method. A debate then began about the boy. Being young, they feared he would not take whiskey, but they were afraid to let him go out on the streets where he might lead people back to the house. When the boy became increasingly anxious about the absence of his grandmother, Burke grabbed the boy and broke the child's back over his knee although he later claimed that the boy had been smothered. Both bodies were wedged into an old herring barrel and fetched eight pounds each from Dr. Knox. Also in June, Burke and Helen took a brief respite from his work to visit some of Helen's relatives. In his later confession, Burke stated that prior to their leaving, Margaret suggested that Helen be murdered, but Burke refused. Probably for this reason, and also because Burke discovered that Hare had been working solo in supplying Dr. Knox during his absence, Burke and Helen moved out of Hare's lodging house and into quarters nearby soon after returning from their vacation. Although living separately, the two men continued to ply their trade as a team. A Mrs. Ostler came to Burke's new boarding house for celebration in honor of the landlord's new baby and was never seen again. A relative of Helen's, Anne McDougall, visited in Edinburgh and stayed with Burke and Helen. Anne was soon dispatched by the usual method, although Burke nobly persuaded Hare to take an active part in that murder, since Anne was a distant friend of Burke's. Anne turned out to be a good friend indeed, providing Burke and his partner with another ten pounds. William Hare met Mary Haldane, an elderly prostitute, in the Edinburgh streets and invited her back to the lodging house for a dram. 
Burke joined them, and Mary drank and fell asleep in the lodging house's stable. She was murdered quickly, but Mary's daughter Peggy, who had been told her mother had been seen with Hare earlier, went to Hare's to ask about her whereabouts. Upon arrival, Margaret and Helen heatedly denied Mary or any prostitute would be allowed into their house. An argument ensued that Hare stopped by saying that Mary had been there earlier, but had later left. Hare then offered Peggy a drink, and then another, and once Burke arrived, she soon joined her mother at Dr. Knox's. The disappearance of Mary Haldane caused suspicion, as she was a well-known character in the neighborhood, and many noticed her absence. Burke and Hare were further emboldened by not being caught, however, and next targeted a very well-known neighborhood resident whose murder would almost be their undoing. Eighteen-year-old James Wilson, known as Daft Jamie in the Westport neighborhood, was a well-known local character. He entertained local children with riddles and jokes, and he lived on the streets or with kind souls who would offer him shelter, although he frequently visited his widowed mother. His only prized possessions were a snuff box and a snuff spoon that had seven holes in it that Jamie used as a calendar to tell the days of the week. In early October of 1828, Hare came across Jamie wandering the streets, looking for his mother, although some versions say Margaret was the one who found him. Hare told him that he knew where his mother was and invited him back to his house to wait for her. Burke was in a local tavern and watched the two go by and observed Hare lead poor Jamie in as a dumb lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep to the shearers. Burke was fetched from the tavern by Margaret, and the Hares and Burke tried to convince Jamie to have some whiskey. Jamie drank only a small amount and refused more, although he was soon dozing on a spare bed. Burke and Hare attempted to put their usual method of killing into play, but Jamie was strong and fought back, successfully enough that he pinned Burke, who screamed to Hare for help. Both men eventually overpowered Jamie and smothered him. That evening, the two men collected ten pounds for Jamie's body. Suspicion grew quickly, however, because Jamie's mother made constant inquiries of her son's whereabouts. Also, when his body was uncovered at Dr. Knox's, several of the students easily recognized Jamie by his face and by a well-known deformity of his foot. Dr. Knox denied that the body was Jamie, but began the dissection quickly, focusing first on those most recognizable features. On Halloween morning, Burke was taking his usual morning whiskey in his local tavern when an old woman entered and began talking with the patrons. Noticing that she had an Irish accent, Burke bought her a dram, and she sat down and said she was Mary Dougherty from Inishowen. Burke said that his own mother was a Dougherty from Inishowen and that they must be related. Having established this bond, he easily persuaded the old woman to come to his house. The visitor was warmly received by Helen and by a couple, James and Anne Gray, who were lodging with Burke and Helen. Burke convinced Dougherty to stay overnight with them and arranged for the Greys to spend the night at the Hare's lodging house. The arrangements being settled, everyone drank in celebration of Halloween, and the whiskey flowed long past nightfall. The Greys eventually left, but were told to return for breakfast the next morning. The festivities continued, and neighbors later claimed to have heard dancing and drinking and arguments coming from Burke and Helen's rooms. Around midnight, an upstairs neighbor was passing by Burke and Helen's door and heard two men arguing and a woman's voice calling out, Murder! and Get the police! There's murder here! The man ran back to the street but could not find a policeman. Passing by the door again, the man stopped but heard nothing, so he assumed the crisis was over and went up to his own rooms. The following morning, the Greys returned and found Mary Dougherty was gone. They asked after her, and Helen told them that she'd thrown the old lady out for being overly friendly with Burke. Anne Gray later went near the spare bed to get some socks she'd left behind, but Burke shouted at her to stay away from the bed. Burke yelled at her a second time when she went near the bed in order to fetch some potatoes. In the early evening, the Greys found themselves momentarily alone in the house, so Anne Gray took a peek and saw the body of an old woman lying beneath the bed. Both Greys bolted from the house, running in to the returning Helen, who asked where they were going. James Gray was outraged and asked Helen what she knew about the body. Helen panicked and begged them not to say anything, claiming that their silence would be worth ten pounds a week. This further incensed the Greys, and James chastised Helen for bringing disgrace upon her family, and the couple went out to fetch a policeman. Helen and Margaret quickly went off to warn their spouses, and were fast enough that when the police arrived at Burke and Helen's that night, 
there was nobody in the house. A neighbor told the police that two men had recently left the house carrying a tea chest. Burke and Helen returned home soon after and innocently asked what the matter was. The police separated the two and asked them individually what had become of the old woman who had been there the previous night. Burke, feeling confident that he and Helen had their alibis in sync, stated that Mrs. Doherty had left their home at 7 o'clock that morning. Helen agreed that she had left at 7 o'clock, but claimed that the woman had left at 7 in the evening. This 12-hour discrepancy was suspicious enough that Burke and Helen were taken in for more questioning. An anonymous tip led the police to Dr. Knox's classrooms, where Doherty's body was found and James Gray positively identified it. The Hares soon joined Burke and Helen in prison, and the police began to slowly unravel the disappearances of so many people from Westport during the previous 11 months. The busy days following Halloween included an official autopsy of Mary Doherty, the questioning of Burke's and Hare's neighbors, and multiple interviews with the four accused. The four had apparently not synchronized their stories. Their tales varied from stating that they had never met Doherty to Burke's telling of a strange man, whom he named as William Hare, coming to his house to get his shoes repaired and who had a large tea chest with him. Helen apparently did not know of this story, however, and she did not echo this alibi or claim that William Hare was a stranger. On November 6th, an Edinburgh newspaper reported on rumors of individuals having of late disappeared, including a sort of half-witted lad called Daft Jamie. This report caught the interest of Janet Brown, who went to the police and identified some of the clothing the police had found in Burke's house as Mary Patterson's. The public was outraged and called for justice against all four principals and Dr. Knox as well. The Lord Advocate, however, was in a quandary about how and whom to prosecute, as there had been no eyewitness to any of the actual killings. The entire case depended on circumstantial evidence which, even including the Gray's testimony and Janet's identification of Mary Patterson's clothing, was weak at best. He also suspected that Helen and Margaret were secondary players and that neither would testify against her male counterpart. After one month of vacillation, under the assumption that Burke had been the leader of the two men, a deal was made where William Hare would receive immunity if he testified against Burke and Helen. Hare readily agreed, and soon after, Burke and Helen were both charged with the murder of Mary Doherty. Burke was also charged with the killings of Daft Janey and Mary Patterson, and their trial began on Christmas Eve. The prosecution brought forth both Hares, who testified that Burke and or Helen were the main players in the murders, and other witnesses who claimed to have seen the victims in Burke or Helen's company shortly before they disappeared. In defense, Burke's counsel tried to downplay Burke's role in the murders, and Helen's solicitor suggested that it was Helen, terrified by seeing Doherty killed, who the neighbor overheard crying murder that Halloween night. Christmas morning, the jury deliberated for only 50 minutes and came back with their verdicts. Burke was guilty, and Helen was freed by the uniquely Scottish, not proven verdict. On hearing of the news, Burke reportedly cried and embraced Helen, saying, You are out of the scrape. Burke was executed on January 28, 1829. In the month between his sentencing and the execution, he gave two detailed confessions. In both of them, he cited 16 murders that he and or Hare had committed, although he got confused with the order of the murders between the two confessions. At his scaffold, enormous crowds shouted for Hare and Dr. Knox to join him at the gallows. Helen, on being released, went back to the house she had shared with Burke, where an angry mob found her and the police had to be summoned so she could escape. She left Scotland for England, but news of the murders had spread as far south as Newcastle and police once again had to protect her from vigilantes in that city. After Newcastle, it's not known what became of her, although lore states that she went to Australia and died there in 1868. Margaret Hare also disappeared. After her release, she escaped angry mobs in Glasgow and Greenock and is believed to have eventually journeyed back to Ireland. William Hare was released in early February of 1829, but did not meet up with Margaret. The last known sighting of him was south of the English town Carlisle, although a popular later tale tells of his being blinded by a mob who threw him into a lime pit and of him becoming a beggar on the streets of London. Dr. Robert Knox attempted to remain in Edinburgh, and he maintained a silence about any suspicions he might have had about how Burke and Hare supplied his classroom with such fresh corpses. Angry crowds occasionally mobbed his house and classrooms, 
but he continued lecturing and giving classes until the number of students who wanted to study under a man associated with Burke and Hare dropped dramatically. He twice applied for vacant positions within Edinburgh University's medical school, but was rejected both times. He eventually moved to London, where he held a post at the cancer hospital before passing away in 1862. Burke and Hare would live on in the culture of Britain, and stories of their crimes would eventually become known around the world. Ironically, they would become most well-known as the kings of the grave robbers, although no proof has ever come to light that they had ever robbed a single grave. In fact, in Burke's confessions of the 16 murders, he specifically denied ever engaging in the much lesser crime of grave robbing. Dramatizations of the Westport murders played to packed houses in Britain throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries in melodrama theatres and community playhouses. In the 1930s, James Bridie's play The Anatomist portrayed the tale on the formal theatre stage. Films such as The Greed of William Hart, The Body Snatcher, The Doctor and the Devils, and The Flesh and the Fiends depicted Burke and Hare's story with varying degrees of accuracy. Burke and Hare have also inspired fiction writers, ranging from Robert Louis Stevenson, The Body Snatcher, to Sherry Holman's acclaimed modern novel, The Dress Lodger. Their crimes even added to the English language. Although not commonly used today, the verb to burke still means to murder someone by violent means or by smothering. And finally, the Westport murders have entered the timeless culture of children's folklore. Threats of visits from Burke and Hare are used by some parents to discipline unruly children, and the pair are even prominently featured in a couple of sing-song rhymes that accompany children's jump rope and hopscotch games. Up the close and down the stair, in the house with Burke and Hare. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief. Knox, the boy who buys the beef. Burke and Hare fell down the stair with a body in a box going to Dr. Knox.